Hello, I'm Gary Tintero, Director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and delighted to welcome our museum's Facebook friends to a sneak peek at our Degas exhibition before it opens to the public today uh, here at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, where it will be open until January 16. Today I want to talk about two paintings, two of the most important paintings in the exhibition. Uh, one called Fallen Jockey, uh, the other called uh, the Dead Jockey. These are two canvases that were more or less uh, completed by Degas, one in, in the 1880s and the later one in the 1890s. Uh, the earlier one is on the left, uh, the later one is on the right. They began as the same idea in Degas' head. If you look at the painting on the right, that was more or less his original conception, uh, a, a jockey that's fallen off his horse. He called the painting Steeplechase Scene, and he exhibited the version on the left at the Salon of 1866. This was the big Paris display that was held almost every year. Thousands of works by aspiring artists and viewed and commented upon eagerly by, by the press. Um, he thought of his painting first as, as, as a flying horse and, and, a, and a fallen jockey. For the Salon painting, he continued to work on it and he included two additional riders and horses at the left. Uh, and there was only one riderless horse uh, in the background. We can barely see it now because Degas painted it out, but you see the shadow of his tail uh, in the sky. Th the jockey was posed for by his young brother, Achille, and we have a lovely drawing that shows Achille um, posing for his brother. Here he is, um, not unconscious, his eyes are open, but you see uh, rather stunned. And there's um, another drawing that shows uh, the articulation of his legs. Um, this is a technique we called foreshortening, where you have a dramatic um, uh, compression of space. And this was often used for, um, let's say, um, pieta scenes or depositions uh, from the cross. So there's a biblical um, aspect to this pose, uh, and it foreshadows death and maybe even uh, resurrection. If we go back and look at the two paintings, uh, we'll see they're very different in, in color and in mood. The painting on the right, uh, excuse me, the painting on the left was uh, repainted by Degas in the early 1880s. He thought he might be able to sell it uh, in, a com in a newly completed state to Mary Cassatt's brother, Alexander, who ran the Pennsylvania Rail Railroad in, in New York and, and Philadelphia. In the end, he didn't release it. He continued to work on it. He added an additional flying horse in the foreground, uh, and he painted out the original horse, and you see him adjusting the rump of the horse uh, just behind the foremost horse. Uh, all these changes trying to adapt the composition and basically address the um, criticism that he received when he showed the painting in 1866. That was when one uh, critic wrote in the paper, um, like the jockey, Monsieur Degas seems to be insufficiently familiar with his horse. Well, that criticism really stung, and he continued to revise that composition. And we have a drawing that shows his thinking process. That's what's so terrific about this exhibition, is that we can literally see the painter thinking. Here, his two uh, jockeys uh, and their mounts. Here you see him revising this horse in the background and thinking about the best expression for the contour. And then you see this extraordinary, almost Chinese style flying horse uh, in the foreground. It's clear that at this point Degas was no longer interested in uh, animal locomotion and accuracy. He was going for uh, expressiveness. And that's very different from the drawing of 1866 when he was working on his painting for the Salon. And you see the smooth finish, the musculature, the anatomy, all the different uh, attempts uh, to get the pose of the, the position of the horse's legs uh, proper. So there were great pains taken by him in order to make this accurate. And in fact, steeplechase racing had become a, a new sport of the French aristocracy. In the 1890s, uh, in the mid-1890s, when, when France was ripped apart by the Dreyfus Affair, in which um, a, there was a cover-up in the army, there had been a corruption scandal, and a Jewish corporal, quite dignified, 
had been scapegoated, court-martialed, imprisoned, and ev eventually pardoned and, and exonerated. But this affair ripped France apart, and you had to either be with the government and with La France, or you could have to accept the fact that government officials whom you trusted uh, were lying were lying to you. Degas, who felt very strongly French, uh, allied himself with the government and against this poor Jewish officer. And he, in fact, broke with many of his Jewish friends uh, at this time, like Camille Pissarro or Ludovic Halevi, who was the author of Carmen's, um, of, uh, of Bizet's Carmen, the great opera. So he had lost many of his friends, and he began to lose his family members. His sister Marguerite died, and his brother Achille, who had posed for the fallen jockey, died also. And so we think that it was at this moment when Degas was very unhappy, when he felt that France was falling apart, going to ruin, uh, and he saw, in fact, that his family was disappearing, that he took back the first sketch for the painting of 1866 and repainted it in the mid-1890s. And it's no longer a fallen jockey. It's a dead jockey. And that horse is not a racehorse. It's the horse of the apocalypse. And that's what Degas thought he was living through in the mid-1890s. Thanks very much for your visit to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston Facebook page, and I hope you'll come see us live at the museum, Maine and Bissonette, here until January 16. Thanks very much.